Hello and welcome back to the Game Pit. I'm Sean, this is episode 93, and here's Ronan. Hello everyone, you're very welcome. This is one of our usual Picking Over the Bones episodes in which Sean and I take a handful of games and dissect them and give you our opinions on how they play. Sean, what delights have you prepared? Well, Ronan, my first game is going to be Shadowscape from NSKN. Then I'm going to go on to some Amerigo, a good old Feld, and we're going to finish off with Holmes, Sherlock and Mycroft. You're very Feldy recently. I feel like we've been Felded. I'm on a bit of a Feld kick at the moment. I recently played Bora Bora as well. We've been going about Aquasphere. We've got to get that song in every episode, apparently. <laughs> Just for Natalie. <laughs> Anyway, three games I am going to be introducing are Time of Crisis, Magic Maze and Aeon's End. We hope you enjoy the reviews and here they come. As always, we are proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there and to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. And you can catch us on Podbean, iTunes and Stitcher. So, to kick us off, I'm going to take us back to 3rd century Rome in Time of Crisis. A 2-4 to four player game, playing time of around 3 hours from GMT. Brad Johnson is one of the designers and the other one is Ray Ferrell, who's known for Sword of Rome. So, keeping on the theme there. And speaking of theme, what's going on? Like I said, it's the 3rd century Roman Empire when there was a crisis. And many years of issues with invasions from outside of barbarians and internal unrest and many different rival claims to be the emperor. Players are going to be representing four of the families, well, up to four if you've got four players, who are vying for the position of empire over these many years. So you're not a particular person. You are trying to create a legacy, as Victory Points called in this game, legacy points for your family. The game itself is a zero shuffling deck builder. Now, curiously, and I haven't planned this, this is one of two of these games that I'm going to be introducing during this episode. So there you go. Eh. A curiosity. What are you trying to do? Well, you're trying to build a deck to use for units on a map. Now, the map is basically Europe during the 3rd century. It's very simplified. It's split into several provinces. Provinces have got places for governors. They've got a capital city. And around the outside are various areas where barbarians can appear. Your deck will correspond to three different points three different currencies if you will and those currencies can be driving player actions during the game and they come as military senate points and populist points with the military you're going to be able to recruit generals and armies for those generals and move those armies around the board in the provinces to start battles you can also get mobs appearing in these provinces at the cost of some of your support from the people you can disperse these mobs with your military you may have your military in the province that doesn't mean you control it in the senate in rome that's all to do with your governors and you can recruit governors using the senate points in your deck those blue senate points can be spent to initiate a vote on who's the governor of a province now how strong the support is of the city governor will affect how you become governor or how difficult it is also what military units are in the provincial capital will affect how easy it is for you to become governor and it's trying to get your governors in place to take control because they will earn you political points every round and legacy points and the political points will help you to buy more cards to improve your deck or thin your deck out and the victory points obviously legacy points are how you're going to win the game the populace you have when you have a governor in place in a province the more popular support they have the harder they are to remove and you use your yellow populist points to increase that support also use it to build improvements now there's three different types of improvements in the game there might be amphitheaters that keep mobs under control or there could be basilicas which will help you if you try and become emperor which is a mechanism we'll come to later there's another one called a limes now why might you build a limes beginning of everyone's turn there's something called the crisis face in which they roll two dice either there's going to be a card drawn from the event deck or barbarians will build up and possibly invade. Your limes will help you, give you a turn to not worry about them so much because if you have marauding barbarians in your provinces, they won't attack you, but they will affect your support, which will make you easier to be taken over. And also, when you add all your support together, the provinces you control, that's how much 
money if you like currency you have to spend to buy cards to improve your deck at the end of your turn now i said barbarians can threaten the other one thing that can happen out of this crisis phase is stuff from the event deck and what can happen in there can be things like an effect to battles invasions are more or less likely improvements can be more or less expensive the person who's the active player might be forced to hold a game which will get rid of a card but will score them some points or one of the ways the game will finish is the emperor diocletian will turn up this was the person who in 284 kind of settled down the empire for a while if he ever turns up it's an instant game over but he will be towards the bottom of the deck and if you're going that long then maybe you're not playing as efficiently as you could with barbarians coming in, I said they will never attack you. However, you can attack them to score a few points if you defeat them, or it's possible to pay them tribute to keep them quiet, or it's also possible to federati them or recruit them into your armies. Build your legacy, get your provinces, build improvements, do battles to score points. The other things you can do to score points are be emperor. Now, one of the provinces is Italia. Whoever is in charge of Italia is the emperor. And the Emperor is going to score points for all the provinces they control. Again, it's a big way of scoring points. Also, every time you finish your turn as Emperor, you've got an Emperor Turns marker, which will move up. And whoever has the most number of turns as Emperor at the end of the game is going to get a bonus in points. 10 points can be quite a lot. It's a game that's played to 40 or 60 points. The other thing you can do, though, is you can become a rival emperor, which is very thematic to what was going on at the time. You can establish two or more provinces where you've got strong support and say, no, these are not part of your empire. These are part of my empire, even though I'm not the official emperor. This is getting confusing. No, it's fine. It all makes sense. And you'll score points for those provinces at the end of your turn. Although if ever you have two or more rival emperors to the actual emperor they'll cancel each other out and they won't be scoring lots of points so you can't all just turtle up and build your own little areas while i've talked about all the points you can spend to use actions apart from the basic cards in your deck every other card you purchase will give you different actions you can take as well as spend the points it's not one of the games where you have to make a choice between points and action this is actually a relatively easy to learn game as GMT goes, but a lot of the depth and flavour comes from those little rules and exceptions of the options you have. Sean, time of crisis. I came into it expecting one thing and left my first game quite shell shocked at what I experienced because it very much looks like a GMT game, doesn't it, really? I don't think GMT looks bland, but they look very serious very serious and prim and proper and this is the way a map should be and this is the way tokens should be and it's all historically accurate etc so it had that gmt feel about the game were you missing out on minis did you want little legionnaires and uh, things with tentacles no i don't because it's a gmt game I, I i know what i'm getting when i buy a gmt game or i play a gmt game and it's very much felt like a gmt game should feel like Build on that more, because GMT do make a variety of games. You look at my shelf of what GMT games I've got; they're all over the place. I've got Talon, that's a spaceship game, and I've got a racing game in Thunder Rally. All sorts of different things. So, what feel were you? How did it? Well, it, not it, beat your expectations, especially, especially like the historical games. They tend to be a map. There tends to be the tokens they use in these historical games tend to be along the same lines. It just has that. So, feel. How, how did it flip those expectations? So, what it, well, what it flipped them was how it almost became a, a, a merry trashy in within the game. Normally in a GMT game, like, okay, I build up and I work towards this, and you know what, I'm going to get it, and it's how efficient I'm going to be on in that process to get to there. But this one felt more like I'm going to have a gamble on this. I'm going to try and do this, and I might fail, I might succeed. And that was where it kind of flipped my, it was like, whoa, what, what kind of game am I playing? Am I playing a fantasy flight game or am I playing a GMT game? He hit me for six, and I really was a bit just dumbstruck in my first game because there was things, things that swung the whole game on the dice roll. I had to go away and think, right, okay, it's not the game I thought it would be. I need to readapt, reorganize my headspace, and then go back at it because there are lots of interesting points to it. I think you mentioned the dice rolls there. They're quite weighted. To do a usual hit... In terms of taking a a province from someone, a hit is two to six. So only one's misses and sixes explode. Now, the six exploding, there's actually been a bit of a, a statistical analysis of it by Martin Griffiths on BGG. 
<laughs> which says the six explosion actually changes the odds more significantly than you think, and certainly more than I thought anyway. But it changes up the game. It does give it um, that unpredictability. I like that a lot. It removes some of the dry feeling you might otherwise have of it. If you know exactly, oh, I go in my four legions, you've got three, I'm going to win, I'll have one left. The fact that in battles, if a legion's hit on a three plus, you've got, if you manage to take any barbarians in or you're fighting them, they hit on a four plus, you've got militia you can raise, they hit on a five plus. It gives a feeling that it matters what the troops are and what you're doing and that there is a chance. I, I like it, Sean. It adds a bit more spice to the mix. I think it does, but one of the, the comforting things about normally going into a GMT game is that you're going to work hard, you're going to set something up, and you're going to achieve it. And as I said, it depends on how well you've set it up and how economical you've been and how cunning you've been. But in this one, a poor dice roll can mess up all that hard work. Now, that's fine if I came into it with my eyes wide open. Now, you had said, like, it isn't your typical GMT. It is a bit swingy sometimes, but I couldn't get my headspace right for that. I think one of the things with the headspace is that because it's dudes on a map, you expect to be able to turtle up, build your little, especially as Euro players, build our little kingdom, improve our economy, and then go from there. Yeah. But the game doesn't really allow for that so no, much. No, not at all. No, you're right. When you're calling for a vote, you can call it anywhere. I could be based down in Syria and Egypt and then just call and say, right, I'm going to try and be governor in Britain. I might not have much military support for myself around there, but I can do it and I can attack you. You can attack each other anywhere. And it, it kind of works in both ways that you're very flexible spatially on the board, but that sometimes can encourage the turtling that I think maybe this is what you're talking about, that we get inclined to turtle, build our economy and go from there. You won't win doing that in this game. The game is too quick. It's much more a game of where are the opportunities? Where can I strike? Where can I get to power quickly? There's, there's a funny thing whereby like having one four value card, just one can be really powerful, can make a difference. If you could set up your rival empire with your one four power card, or you can make a Praetorian Guard attack, huge difference. The way you get them is, if you want to purchase a card, if you don't have as many provinces as the card costs, the cost is double. So if I've only got three provinces, and no matter how many players you've got, there are three provinces each in play. If I've got three provinces, a four-value card costs me eight. So to take the opportunities to suddenly grab a fourth province while you can, even if you can't keep it, and grab a four-value card on that turn is huge. So that can be a game changer, just that one strike and one move. And it's a game of those sudden game changers. It's sort of going into that knowing that that how important that is. And one of the most important things which you stipulated in your, in your rules rundown was that emperor, if there isn't a rival emperor card available somewhere on the board, then getting that emperor is a very, very strong move. We've played games where... The game has has swung on who got Emperor. Like I might have gone in with four dice to try and get a certain amount and missed, and then the player after me goes in with exactly the same odds, hits, wins the game. It feels really important with novices. I think later on, that's what I went away and started thinking about. Hang on, how could I have stopped that? And I came up with three or four ways that I could have stopped that happening. But going in sort of not understanding the game, it felt really punishing to me and I was quite upset by it. It's also the fact that the learning game is played to 40 points. Now, I think that's a good thing because it's a game that after you play once, twice, three times even, you're kind of going, I've played that poorly. I, I, I'm learning as I go. I'm looking at different opportunities and what I can and can't do. So you only play to 40 points. That means that there are probably maybe four turns where there's going to be an emperor in the game. So yeah, especially in the learning game, when you don't know how to strike back, you don't really have time to set up a rival empire. Not so much anyway. It does feel incredibly powerful. And I think that this is a game to play once at 40 points and then move on to the 60 points where the true heart and the meat of the game can fully develop. And it's not just a first strike will win sort of a situation. Even at 60 points, do you think the random factor is just right? Or do you think it, it's maybe slightly overwhelming? What's your, what are your thoughts? The random factor in the dice, I don't mind, as I said. One of the things that feels random but isn't, you can't really blame it, is 
that you choose your hand. So I said it's a zero shuffling card game, but I didn't really explain how in this case. It's once your draw pile has run out, you pick your discard pile up and you just put it all into your draw pile. And then every turn, you choose your hand of five cards. You look through your whole deck, pick the ones out you want and say, right, I'm ready to go. You do that at the end of one turn. Now, especially in a game with four players, three other players taking their turns and three other crisis things happening can completely change the board state. And then you look at your hand and go, oh, this hand is now useless. I cannot respond to the fact that three barbarians have just turned up in two of my provinces. I've got no military here. Also, I've got no tribute. I'm just going to lose support. I might even lose a whole province. Allowing someone else to just walk in and take it off a neutral governor and I chose those cards when I didn't know this was happening. I think that is the bit that feels most random to me. I know that Heavy Cardboard talked about it on there, and they said, especially at the beginning of the game, they allow people to look at the board and then choose their five cards. Doing that the whole game would slow things down a lot. But I almost think it might be worth it. I might like to try it. Because that, for me, Sean, feels worse than, okay, there's a dice roll, there's a bit of a chance. You kind of know that's happening. Yeah, it, it did add to to the sort of feel that there was a lot of random going on and that it felt like the game should be tighter. And I'm harking back on, but it's kind of my theme for this review is that I felt that it should be tighter and I didn't get what I, what I thought it was going to be. So, yeah, it, it irritated me at first. It really did. Also, especially when you're getting through your deck and you're going to discard pile, and, and maybe you could say this is entirely the player's choice, it is possible to have just like a zero-use turn. Especially at the beginning, you haven't thinned your deck out at all. You pick up, you go, I've got one blue, I've got two red, I can't do anything with, and two yellow, and all my support is good, and I can't build anything. What am I going to do? So, so there are funny things like that. Like you say, maybe it feels a bit looser, but then a lot of the time I'm thinking, is it just because I'm rubbish? Because this isn't the type of game we usually play. The other thought I had, well, firstly, the kind of last two points are, it is best with four players. It gets tight with three and super tight with two and it's hard to make that grab of a fourth province grab whatever level four card you want to develop your strategy of how you want to win this game but here's the last real major point i want to make to you sean when i first started playing it my mind started pinging off going do you know what i might next time i might try and just build a completely yellow and blue deck and then i tried it and then people were just placing their military into my capitals and my yellow and blue were useless. So then I was like, okay, maybe you can just go strong red deck and you go hard military. So I tried that and that didn't work either because I didn't have enough political points. I couldn't get enough good cards in my hand or thin my deck out. So I was like, oh, from the perceived strategic width I had for my first couple of plays, it has occurred to me that actually you need to have a balanced deck. And while I thought the deck building would be the strategic part of the game, it's not. You kind of have to keep it even up. It's very much more something we've been knocking on the door of saying this whole time through for Time of Crisis. It's a tactical game, and it's tactically how what you put the five cards in your hand and tactically how you use them that's going on. And it's not the strategy game I thought it was going to be. Yeah, you, <laughs> when we were playing together, you mentioned... When we had our little discussion after, you mentioned, oh, you know what, next time I play it, I think I'll do this. And I was, the word clown was running through my head. <laughs> I'm like, I can't I see how that's working. Ahead. But you know what, let, let him go and find it on his own, bless him. <laughs> he found. He found. Yeah. yeah. Not so good. Yeah. You can go heavier on something. But if you, I think if you go for like total red, total blue, you kind of opening yourself up. You need all three. Areas. You yeah. really need all three. Okay. Sean, your final thoughts on Time of Crisis. So, Time of Crisis is a game that probably plays out in a length that I really, really appreciate. Has loads of mechanisms that I have said in the past I really appreciate. Has the historical accuracy that I really enjoy. But if I'd have known all that first, <laughs> then I would have come into this game and I would have hit the ground running with it. As it is... Because of the fact I thought it was going to be a deeper, more intense strategy game, really, it didn't go off on the right foot at all. It's slowly winning me back. I'm not there yet, but every time I play it, I learn something new about the game and something new about how I can manipulate the game, and that is the sign of a good game. We agree with each other here in terms of the depth and it being more tactical. However, while you're going, it's growing on you, 
for me, it's actually gone back a little bit. Let's say the first three games of it I played, I was, wow. And as you said, I walked away and I was thinking about the game. My mind was buzzing. Ideas were popping in my head. And I was thinking, I could have tried this. I could have tried that. I could have moved those troops into that capital and there was a chance. As I played it more after those initial games, it occurred to me, actually, I can't really do that. Or at least I can't plan for them. If that situation has to develop on the board, then I happen to have the hand to be able to do it. And then sometimes I might be able to strike and make clever moves. Would that be improved by choosing my hand at the beginning of my turn? I'm going to try it and see. But Time of Crisis has gone back from a wow, amazing game back to a very good game. A game that I enjoy playing. A game that is different to a lot of games I have. It's got some Euro elements. It's got some war elements. It's a war row, as people are calling it. But not top notch. It's next grade down. Maybe I'm not sure it would even make my top 100 at this moment in time. So there you go. A very good game, but not the knockout hit it was after my first few plays. That's Time of Crisis. Okay, that's quite surprising for me to hear hear that from Ronan. We are going to move on now to Shadowscape, the 2017 release from NSKN Games, designed by Blazek Kubaki, maybe. This game is set in the Mistfall world. It is billed as a, a mini dungeon crawl is how NSKN described this. So what you have with this game is you have a a modular board. And on this board, it's going to be filled with monsters and treasures. And each room, uh, apart from obviously the edge rooms, is going to have a door out of it. And there's going to be a little symbol on that, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. While playing the game, players have four double-sided action cards. These are your your basic actions and your, your actions to choose from each round. The twist is that you must flip the card that you use, and that's going to offer you a, another action. So it's all about planning your actions ahead. What do you need next turn? What are you going to need the turn after, maybe? So trying to get the right actions in turned face up for the round that you're about to play. The cards also act as your damage counters. So if you get enough damage on your on each card, then you can't use that card. The only card that you'll use if you get completely filled up with damage is the one that gives you health back, so you can never completely die. The monsters on this modular board, they are going to use those symbols that I mentioned by the doors to move around the dungeon. You're going to flip a card, see what monsters move, and they'll tell you themselves where they're going to go. So one might move through this symbol and then through another symbol. And they're all going to, basically, they're going to move around this board. You can predict where they're going to be going. What players are trying to do is uh, move around the board, get to certain areas with a certain amount of I know, search points, get to certain, kill certain monsters, and every time they do this, they, they will score victory points, and more victory points will come out with new tasks on them. You can also upgrade your action cards, and you can have a maximum of five. So you start with four, you can go up to five. And eventually, when you've done a few of these tasks and moved around a bit, the big boss is going to come in and you're going to try to kill him and then the game is going to end there are two game modes that you can play you can play competitive or cooperative it is very much suggested that the competitive mode is what the game's all about and the cooperative is just for if you don't fancy going up against each other ronan missed fall artwork very very abundant in this game i do like a bit of missed fall artwork it looks very pretty Mm, disagreeing already (laughs) there's some nice artwork here and there overall in terms of looking at the game no 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 I didn't say that I didn't say that well that's why I I said artwork (laughs) (laughs) I said artwork the artwork on the tiny wee tiles (laughs) it looks looks nice oh that was a misleading lead in (laughs) for a disagreement there right Fine then, mister. The very individual artwork is there. Miss has got good artwork. Uh, and the other things in the line, there's more games coming. We might mention them in a while. The artwork's great. It invokes the theme. Let's not harp on Miss too much because it's coming in another episode soon. But kind of wasted. Because when you're looking at the table, it's grey and it's very small tiles. And you're pulling along. And I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't particularly care what the monsters were individually anyway. They were a set of symbols and some figures. And the whole thing 
had such a strong puzzle aspect to it, both within the movement of the cards, but also within the movement on the board and how you score points and what you're trying to achieve, that the theme was gone. And this is one of the cases where I know that they're building this misful world. I know they're trying to, to run through and create other worlds in there. And fine, fair enough, they've got kind of a good story going on with misful. I'm not sure it suited this particular set of mechanisms. Yeah, I agree with you, which is it's slightly upsetting because like the monsters, if you actually looked at them and if you keep hearkening back to Miss Fall, then I'll, I'll stop doing it because this is Shadowscape. You probably won't stop doing it, but I anyway. probably won't. But there you go. Um, the monsters actually act thematically as they did in Miss Fall. So like you've got the hounds, they will move really quickly around the board and the big beast characters, they lumber around. So you've got plenty of time to dodge them if you need to. So you can probably stay a bit closer to them. They kind of moved around thematically, but as Ron has said, yeah, they really were a symbol. It was like the green symbol, the blue symbol, and the red symbol. Okay, the, the things with the red symbol move, you didn't really care what they were and what they were doing. Well, the other thing was with those monsters that the board starts full of them, and they're all moving around, and very early on, you're likely to get whacked a couple of times. It's it's hard to, to dodge your way through this maze, if you like. But then once you start knocking them out and collecting them and using them to get rewards and, and to score points, the board empties out and the danger and the options available to you all reduce. And that was quite strange as well to me, that the game started off frantic and then reduced down to a slower pace. Yeah, if you have a game like one of the ones that we had when we, we played a three-player game with Rachel and yourself, we ended up with one of each type of monster. Now, when all the types of one go, the next turn, they'll all reseed and board will fill up again with that type of monster. But we ended up with one of each. So we were able just to potter around, do what we fancied, have a cup of tea, have a little picnic, and we knew exactly where they were going. Some of them were just going in a constant loop. One of them was just literally back and forth, back and forth. All the danger, all the excitement, gone because there's no monsters in this dungeon mm, mm. it's curious that you kind yeah. of feel like there should be more spawning each turn or the yeah. uh, the minimum number shouldn't be zero at one least thing, you know give me something to, to, to interact with on yeah. the board. one thing i wanted to ask you right now uh, we we previewed this game before and we were i think you were excited i certainly was excited about this action system because i thought it sounded fantastic that you had to plan your actions and in reality it all became a bit having to plod through the same actions over and over because i found myself using the same two or three actions over and over again and other than that i I didn't feel like i had a lot of choice in what i was doing my character was kind of set out for me if that makes any sense there's definitely a case that each character has got a combo in which if you can establish it so that your set of cards looks like this, you flip that one, you flip that one, that's your major move. It's especially true for like the mage-like characters because they build up, do one big hit, which can be extremely powerful, and then they have to spend a while to build up again, which, again, that kind of feels like, oh, yeah, a mage, big strike, then rest, big strike, then rest. That's sort of standard how mages we've decided in the world act and the fighters might be better at just chipping away slowly so it's learning that combo is quite interesting for half a game and then like you say it becomes a case of well now i'm just running through this combo because i know this is the best way to use this character and it kind of brings me on to two points and the first one is that that action selection and using cards i really like it's a really good idea in doesn't suit this game i don't feel like the mechanism has been tied to a full game and also it gives you the option to bring in extra cards and get one as a reward they just felt completely superfluous because they didn't suit the combo so they were out on the edge and it was a case of well i better take one because it's worth a couple of points but it's not doing me any good over here and i'm very rarely going to use it and in fact i'll probably just use it to chuck a load of hits on if ever i need to so the game was already built it was too precise it was here's your character that's how you should play it off you go and i felt like the game sort of played me a bit yeah i didn't even have that issue with the the combo 
because my guy was all about hitting for range. He could hit quite a lot with range, maybe getting some of the the symbols that generate. But yeah, with different well, characters have got different. Yeah, characters. they've all got different things. Your but I didn't really still have want something set up. It's yeah, yeah. To be, you know, have your yellow heroic symbols up so it becomes slightly more powerful or something yeah, like that. Yeah. But even with the yellow, like the starting yellow heroic symbols, you start with like two or three, but one of them's on the flip side of the action, you need to use them. And it felt like I've already got something that does three damage, so why would I bother having to chain these together when I've just got the one shot anyway? So yeah, that character felt a bit broken that there wasn't really anything for me to chain together. And then again, the cards that were available, they weren't really improving my deck so again it was a case of pick the one with the two hit points you could get much more and you were constantly recycling your deck and there was really interesting cards that you could swap them in with and then all of a sudden you may end up with five completely different cards but it was quite hard to get them yeah it, it might have been nicer if it didn't start off with all those monsters on the board it started off with very few and they built up and then you started off with very basic cards and then you could lead yourself in a certain direction and you could upgrade as you went. But then what we're talking about, Sean, is a completely different game. That's not what Shadowscape is. And it's not what's presented. It's I feel like you feel like, <laughs> similar to me, there's promise here. There's something that works. There's a system. But it hasn't been turned into a fully fun game. It's a mathematical system that all makes logical sense, but is missing that, that spice, that magic dust. One more point, Ronan, and it's something that I have, I've encountered at least two-thirds of the time I've played this game. And I went on BGG just to check and see if it was just me, and it's not. It's actually an issue that people have had with the game. When that big-end boss monster comes up, quite often, nobody or only one person can kill it. Yes, and I think that comes down to part of the luck with the upgrades you can get. You can get equipment, and the game almost relies on certain characters getting decent equipment to help them out. And if it doesn't come out because you're, you're choosing from a lineup, then it's not going to come, and that character can't really do much. In theory, it might work, but in practice, didn't really. And whoever has the strongest character is going to win the game. I did feel that quite a lot. And leading back to that thing, you've got set combos in Shadowscape. Here's how your character works. Okay, thanks. I think we're singing from the same hymn book quite a lot on this one, Ronan. Do you want to? Do you want to just sum up for us? Yeah, it's a good idea that never quite crossed the hurdle into a good game, because it's mechanically actually fairly strong, if not that fun. The design is bringing out a deck builder in the same world. It's called Chronicles of Frost. It's coming out in 2018, and I'd like to see where he develops this from, from quite a, a narrow set of four or five cards for a character to a whole deck you can build. And if you have got that adaptability and you have got the ability to create your own character and adapt to what's going on around you and there is pacing in the enemies, I've got my eye on it. I think it could go somewhere. So I'd play Shadowscape again. I can't see myself ever asking for it. So, as I said, we did preview this game, uh, Shadowscape, and I was very excited about it. And Yes, there are some very clever mechanisms in it, and it was probably on the edge of being a decent or maybe even a very good game. But what I think we've got is it's quite boring, it's quite repetitive, it's unbalanced. I don't think it's clever enough to really appeal to the Euro market or creative enough to appeal to the thematic market i just feel like a little bit of pushing it out a bit more maybe a little bit of play testing i don't know what just to sand off the edges of this one push it in a particular direction and not sort of hover over two areas which is not really scratching the itch of either it's disappointing to me but it's just not a game i don't think i even want to play again unlike ronan so yeah oh, i'm afraid oh, sh shadowscapes it's a big miss for me a big miss. A big oh, miss. Pulled that one out. Well, here's one. That if it's a big miss for you, we might have to have some falling out between us. Oh, I'm ready for it. Are I'm you? Ready for it. Are you ready for the magic maze? <laughs> one to eight players. Up to 15 minutes playtime from Casper Gappis' first design from Sit Down Games and Pegasus Spieler. Thematically... Make some sense of this, if you will. You control four adventurers who have to rob shops in a modern shopping mall and then escape. 
without being caught within the time limit. No. When I say adventures, I mean elf, dwarf, mage, and barbarian. No. No, me neither. No. 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 Anyway, we'll move on. Actually, what you're doing in Magic Maze, each player is going to get an action tile. And no matter how many players there are, there's going to be one or more cardinal directions on that tile. Then there's a middle tile that starts the game. You put the four pawns, which represent the four adventurers, and they have a different colour each, on the middle tile. And you make sure the middle tile and everyone's action tile are aligned in one direction. You can move any of the pawns, but you can only move them in the direction indicated on the action tile in front of you. And from that middle tile, there's going to be four search spots around the edge, and they are going to be related to the four different colours of the adventurer. So we're trying to get the yellow adventurer onto a yellow search spot, in which case the person who has the search action on their action tile is able to flip over the next tile in the stack and put it in alignment to wherever we just searched. And that action tile will have exits which will be colour coded. And we're attempting to get all of our pawns on to all of the search spaces on exit tiles to reveal the whole stack now the size of the stack is going to be dependent upon which scenario you're playing in this game but i'm going to describe the very simple scenario to you and we'll build up from there there are other things you can do there are escalators and only person with the escalator action is able to move our adventurers up or down the escalators there are vortexes for each of the colors and once a pawn is on a vortex of its own color the person with the vortex action can move that pawn to any other vortex of that color each of the pawns are attempting to find their colour shop and stand in it. Usually it's going to require you unveiling all of the tiles. Once you have done that and all four simultaneously are in their colour shop, you flip over, you can have no more vortex tiles, but you're then trying to get them to the one exit that's available in the basic scenario. Now I said you flip a timer at the beginning of the game. If the timer ever runs out, you've lost the game. However, there are timer spaces which if you put an adventure on, you can choose to activate and you will flip the timer over. Once all the adventures have found their shop, then found the exit, you've won the game. If the timer runs out, you have lost the game. Sounds easy. It kind of is because you can talk to each other. And that's how you learn the game. It's very simple rules to teach. From there, I'm going to quickly whiz you through the escalating challenge. Next game, you're not allowed to talk to each other. That makes it a lot harder. Then instead of there being one exit, there's four exits, one for each colour of adventurer. Next thing you move on to is every time you flip the timer by activating a timer space, you must pass your action tile to the next person on your left. That really makes it a lot harder. And now you're really starting to think on your feet. Then things come in the tiles like walls that only the dwarf, the orange pawn can move through. Or if you search with the elf, everyone can speak to each other. There's a crystal ball which allows, if the mage stands on it, two more tiles to get presented anywhere else. Although you flip over to a harder central tile once you bring that into play. And there are more tiles in the stack, making it more challenging. Then there become security cameras. If two of them are ever out at once, then you can never flip the timer again. But the barbarian can smash them to take them out. And then there are four security cameras available. And then you can move on into different challenges using those same rules. And you've gone up to a big stack of tiles by this point, And it all becomes very, very easy difficult and if that wasn't hard enough maximum security the expansion has just been announced and it's going to move on to having security guards and ventilation shafts and the barbarian can run through walls and you've got a spelunking dwarf and there's spells and there's telekinesis and there's code locked doors and there's laser sensors and there's a beholder that can appear in the mall which will stop you from doing things and it goes onwards and upwards in a frenetic co-op game of magic maze trying to beat the timer to get our adventurers to their shop and out the exit sean Magic maze. What do you expect me to say? As a person who doesn't like real-time games, what do you expect me to think of this game? This is the game that changed your mind. That's what I'm thinking. No. If I am inclined to like a real-time game, as we talked about when we discussed Flatline, it's those quick bursts, and then everyone have a chat, discuss tactics, Rachel, by the way, Rachel is obsessed with Flatline. I know she is. Like every game's night, she gets it out. She's like, Flatline, Flatline. It's been a huge hit, right? But you do get that in this because every time you flip the timer over, you can have a chat. And it's your time you're using, but you can go, okay, that thing's doing, that he's doing, they need to go there. What's the plan? Let's go yeah, here. Yeah, but you're, Off you're we still, go. It's still, the, it's still the time. It's not a relaxed chat. It's like, right, come on, we've got to talk about this bit. You did it. Doesn't that sound yeah. fun? 
Does it sound like, yeah, we've got to do this. It's a challenge. Let's work together. It sounds like a chore. Oh, you're a chore. I can look, right, so I can look at this one in two different ways. I can look at it the way I genuinely feel about the game, okay, which is going to be a really hard sell for me. Or I can look at it through your eyes as somebody who enjoys this or somebody who's not adverse to a real-time game. And yeah, I can see, I can see the enjoyment. Not in your kids because you'd force them to play it 93 times. <laughs> I really have. You really had that day. <laughs> so I could see in your eyes how much you were enjoying it. And yeah, I could see it's genuine co op. You've all got to pull your weight. There's no alpha because, especially when you can't talk, there's no one barking orders at you. Yeah, very clever design. I will say about the board, I thought the board was very busy. I really struggled to pick things out on that board. There was so much design and little pictures. and But yeah. that's part of it. Yeah, I, maybe, maybe. But it, it was, again, something that irritated me. Like, where am I supposed to be going? I can't find it. And then you get in a panic and then, oh, there it's up. There. But that's right good. When you panic, it's the best part of it. I don't like oh, it, though. I should be able to do this. Why am I being so stupid? I hate it. And I've got a question for you. Is the tapping on the table actually part of the mechanism or is it something you do? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't do it. I'm not too bad. No, so no, 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 no. Just like When you it... can't talk, yeah. there's a special pawn that you're supposed to sort of indicate to someone by tapping or handing it to them and say, you need to do something before I can do something. There's actually one of the challenges, Sean. You play with the tiles for one fewer player, and one player only has that pawn. That's all they can do until the timer flips, and then you pass it round again. That so pawn. imagine you were that player. All you could do was just sit there with the red thing. Oh, I was that player going. Oh, tap, can tap, you tap, imagine? Tap, 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 tap. <laughs> you see, you're changing it slightly because you're saying that there's no specific rule that says you have to tap. Oh yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So is that you just being irritated? No, that... no, that was the rule we we gamed for Ooh. if you need to do the timer mm. and we've suddenly realised time is really running out, then we tap it quickly to say, ah, time's <laughs> running out because it's so like, right. oh, we've nearly lost, we didn't check. That's all that is. Right. That pawn is probably singularly the most irritating mechanism <laughs> of any game <laughs> I've ever You're played. such a flower. Someone tapping it in front of you. I know I need to do something. <laughs> I know. God damn it. <laughs> it's it's like encouragement. It's like yes, yeah, yeah. This is your moment. This is your time to strike. I I, I hated you after that game. I hated you. I was quite easy going with that pawn. Ish. Ish. <laughs> Uh, I just get into it. That's all it is. I just, I'm excited. I'm, I'm enjoying the challenge. You know, I kind of, my brain's whirring quickly and I'm like, right, cool. Right, but, 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 right, let's do this. Yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I love that. I love the getting keyed up. This, it's a challenge for us to defeat together and high five and go, yes. And I think that's where we're obviously, <laughs> that's where we are. Our paths do not travel along the, along the same route anymore is that, you love that part of the game. I really don't. It stresses me out. It irritates me. It makes me moody. So, yes. Oh, do you know what? I think that's about as deep as this review needed to be. Yeah, but... Or was I just introduced the game and you go, I hate these games. And I go, I love these games. <laughs> <laughs> but objectively speaking, it is a very, very clever design. It all works together. As I said, there's no, you can't have an alpha player. It can be very funny. It can be frustrating, even for people enjoying it, because you know somebody needs to do one thing or nothing. It can be incredibly them. frustrating. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's whether you whether you like that or whether you, it upsets you. So it's a personal choice, I suppose. With this game, I did feel like and you're gonna you're gonna hate me for this one. You know, when you go away with work on one of those retreats. And it's like on those exercises where they say, right, you've got to fall, you've got to trust the person behind you, or you've got to work together and you've got to tie your legs together. And it felt a little bit like that. Oh, you just don't like people. <laughs> they don't like you. So it doesn't well, help that I played it with you. And other people. <laughs> oh, this, is, this, this game is like a puppy I've just bought. There's the most adorable puppy in the whole world but still piddles on my stuff and chews my stuff up. So it drives me crazy 
but I adore it with my whole heart. I'm like, oh my god, why have you chewed up my games? Oh, I don't look at the puppy. I love the puppy. Let's go play. That's what Magic Maze is. It has a special place in my heart, even though it drives me crazy. And they get all excited, and I'm all like, ah, ah, timer, ah. I love it. It's brilliant. I can't believe how good it is. I, lo- is. I love the way you use puppies when what you really do mean is the cats that you have at home that you pretend to hate, but you really love. <sighs> Why you got to bring cats into everything, man? Why? Look how happy I was a minute ago. And now you start telling me about... Sorry, sorry, internet. Cat- cats. <laughs> no. Puppies! Magic Maze is a contender for Game of the Year. Go on, Sean. Move on. <laughs> Okay, so after this little break, we're going to be coming back with my next game, which is Amerigo. Welcome back from our short interlude. Sean is going to bring us deeper into his Felderverse. I am going to talk about Amerigo, the 2013 release, obviously, from himself. Stefan Feld and from Queen Games. So the very loose thing in this is that you're following in the footsteps of the famous explorer uh, Amerigo Vespucci. And you're going to be exploring the new world. You're going to be building, harvesting, producing, mooching around the new world, doing stuff. So what have you on the table? Well, you've got three areas. You've got a map area. In this map area is going to be a archipelago of islands a a group of islands and you are going to be moving your ship around these islands landing giving yourself a harbor or a little port and then from then on you can cover up the islands with tiles and every time you cover up a produce from that island then you're going to take that tile from the island you also have a player board. This is where you're going to keep track of money, your technological progress, and cannons to fight off those naughty pirates that keep appearing. The main area of the game is the storage board that contains the famous cube tower. Now, what the cube tower does is every action that you can do in this game has a set of seven colored cubes. So each turn of a round is going to be literally picking up all cubes of one colour, putting them into the cube, and because it's already been seeded with cubes, then not only that colour is going to fall out. And the way you're going to choose your action is, it's the most numerous colour, is your, the amount of action points you have to spend, and then any colour available in the tray at the bottom is the action you can do. Now, what are the actions? So the blue cubes simply move your ship around. The black cubes are going to improve your cannons to fend off those pirates, which are an ever-present and increasing threat. The red are going to plan those buildings that you put on the island. The green are going to allow you to build the buildings. Brown cubes are going to be increase you on your progress track, which every time you get to a certain point, you're going to be able to take a tile, which improves your move. Yellow are the production tokens. Now, I mentioned collecting cotton, coffee, tobacco, etc. The only way you're going to score these is being able to produce them and send them back. So the production tokens are very important for scoring those at the end of the game. White tokens. Now, there's a special white progress track. Now, depending on what color you move up to, you can substitute that color in for the white cube. So you can specialize in a certain color if you wanted to. Also... This is the turn order track, which can be incredibly important. So the further you are along on this track, it's going to be first player. I mentioned that you have a gold tracker on your player board. Every cube that comes out, you can divide it by three, and that is how many gold you can bring into your onto your gold track, if you so wish. And gold is used to enhance the action that you choose. The game is played over five rounds, and as in any good field, points are scored for many things, including building over those islands, finishing an island, production at the end of the game. You've got to score points on the special action tracks, and the pirates are going to take points off you. Ronan, we were put off by this one for a little while after seeing it first in 2013 Essen. Were we not? Well, it's still ugly. <laughs> it's still ugly. It's still ugly, I agree. It's not even easy to tell the different colours on the tiles. So they're neither functional nor attractive when you put them down on the islands. The whole island, I know why, and it's very clear at least, you know, the islands are blocky, but 
they don't look that great. There's no particular artwork. It's not attractive to the eye overall, Sean. No, I think you take away the spectacle of having that cube tower, and I don't think there's anything particularly appealing about this game at all to the eye at first glance. At least the spatial part of it is clear, and actually that is quite crucial now with the cube tower going on and with the different tracks and you can get your individual bonuses and there's this and there's that and the other it almost feels like you can get easily distracted from the fact is the heart of the game is the spatial aspect the getting on an island blocking the anchors so that no one else can come on that island it will actually cost you points because you'll score points once the island's finished for how many trading posts are built on there but it'll allow only you access to the goods on there and you'll have free place of tiles and things like that and where you send your ships and where everyone else sends their ships is all hugely crucial to how well you do and first time players might get distracted by all the guff that's going on the heart of the game is that map the game is driven by the cube tower, so it's very easy to get drawn to the cube tower and think, wow, okay, that's that's where the game is, but it's not. You need to have that functionality to be able to see at a glance where people are, where they can get to, so that you can possibly intercept or just try and get in on their action a little bit. And that's, again, a really big part of this game. It's it's not always a nice game. It's, you can really get into each other and take points away from each other, block people off. Yeah, yeah, Feld has that. He's kind of lumped in with these other designs, which are not that interactive and multiplayer solitaire and all that. And people treat it as if it's all one huge soup of, of soulless Euros. But this one is really very, very interactive. Everything players do, again, especially back to the map, is crucial. Turn order is crucial. Who gets to purchase the uh, bonuses for the goods, the factories, is crucial. Very much not a game you can be head down and ignore the other players. 100%. 100%. Now, everyone goes on about the cube tower. So it, it was it was famed from um, Wallenstein and in the past. And I always had my doubts about how it was as drive the game. I found, Ronan, that it really, really worked. All the cubes didn't just drop out. All the cubes do well. Apart from when Steve Paget throws cubes in, then they do generally tend to come out sometimes. But I thought it was a really good piece of theatre in the game, kept you on your toes. You never knew exactly what was going to come out. I agree with you 90% of the time. Okay. I think it's brilliant. And it is interesting. And waiting for, let's say, some red points, and there's one or two red cubes left in there and seven whites are going in and you're thinking this could be it i could get a seven red action from this if one of these cubes will just come out for me please come out and it does or it doesn't and you know that swings of fortune and the rest of it i think most of the time are you going to whinge about your pirates again your cannons no no i'm not going to whinge about it I mean, <laughs> that happens if your cubes get stuck in there and you're waiting on them, they don't come out you've taken a risk take the action when it's that action's turn, when all the cubes get dumped in and it's there for four or five or whatever it may be, if you want to be solid and secure and know it's going to happen, then you take the action then. If you choose to delay and say, all oh, right, cool, there's five black cannons out this time, but one green, I'm going to take it as a five green. Those other two blacks might never come out. Not until next time round. And if you were relying on one or two of them coming out, it hasn't happened, it's your fault. You're taking a gamble. That bit I quite like. It's more when there are turns when it's dead, when there's nothing really you can do, or you know, there are turns in the game where white and yellow are the only cubes that come out, and there are no more factories left to be purchased. So you kind of go, well, I can't do that. So everyone's moving on the turn order track. Now, the turn order track itself is brilliant. We'll come on to that in a second. But it's not just being butthurt about, oh, certain turns didn't go my way. It's certain turns are just dead turns and everyone's going to do the same thing and it was kind of pointless. Now, I'm not unhappy to play with it. I just don't think it's sort of amazing and, and life-changing. It's fantastic and works every time. See, now, I think that's part of its charm is that sometimes you're just going to get a daft round and you just don't know when that's going to come. Like, we, we threw cubes in it. Nothing came out. It's like, oh, Next, let move on, and everyone had a good laugh, and we gave abuse to the person throwing the cubes, and you move on. And I found that was part of its charm. I played it again 
this weekend just gone. And we had a couple of times when either nothing or just two cubes, one of each colour came out. And it abused the cube dropper. Move on. Brilliant. I like it. It just happened slightly too often for me. That's all. It's just you know, every now and then a duff round, but when two rounds out of seven are often duff and you're like, mm, so I haven't, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I just haven't had it happen to me as, as often as that. I think maybe, to be honest, that's happened two in 14, one in 14. Mm, nah, no way, no way. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we were talking about the turn order track. Yes. Right? That is one of my favourite things in the game is that when you do choose the white action and you choose to move ahead, you are considering not just who's going to be first, okay? Because that would be easy. All right, I'll take a white, I push forward, I'm going to get first choice on factories and movement and tiles and all the rest of it. And yeah, of course, it's handy. Almost more important is what colour do I land on? Do I take all of these movement points or take partial movement points and leave myself, for example, on the blue? Because I know my ships are not in a good position. So I'm going to need to use both white and blue cubes to move them quickly to get them out of where they need to be. It's a really elegant, player-controlled way to get yourself out of a hole when you require a particular action. Yeah, not only just to get yourself out of a hole, it's to also maybe to really propel what you've gone for. So for instance, if you've, you've spent a few rounds maybe building up your store of land tiles to go on islands, then maybe you take that white opportunity, move it forward to a green. Now you've got lots of opportunity in greens to really push them out, get them onto the board, score yourself lots of points. So it can enhance and pull you out of the problem. And as you said, you, you said it absolutely perfectly. It's an elegant design. Okay, let's go from the elegant to the inelegant. <laughs> in practically all Stefan Fell designs, there's always an obstacle. Not just mechanical, as in the cube tower and you've got work going around there, but something within the game that's a pain that is preventing you to do something. It's the punishment mechanism he always puts in. Rats in Notre Dame, octopods in Aquasphere, whatever it may be. Pirates in this game are the least elegant of the standard felled obstacle mechanism. They're not particularly fun. They're just a punishment. They're just a distraction. They're just like, oh, you know, I'll spend a few black cubes or I won't spend a few. I don't like the pirate mechanism, even though I tried to exploit it last time we played a year ago. And I quite often do. And I might take the tiles that will help me out with them. I still don't like them. They're not as clever as the rest of the game. Fairly indifferent to them. I think I think they kind of have to be there just for that additional choice. I'm not sure about some of the tiles that go with them. So if one player manages to get like the tile that says you only get half the penalty, if they get that early, that's quite a big step up for that player because they can practically ignore the pirates. So I think that tile may be a bit broken. I quite like the one that makes everyone pay, that you got that makes everybody pay an extra two pirates apart from that person. I thought that was quite funny. But actually that kind of ruin that game for the pirates because everyone just went meh whatever i just took the punishment and went it was so hard to get i'm not spending two of my seven actions every turn dealing with pirates so meh, who cares so they almost became irrelevant but they just don't work i'm sure there was something smarter he could have done there i'm fine I, it doesn't bother me as much as it bothers you while we're talking about tiles and what may or may not be great or good or whatever the red and the green bonus tiles taken by one player, automatic win? I would say probably. It obviously depends on how quickly they get them and how well they exploit them. But yeah, yeah, it's a very, very powerful combination. And I had it happen to me. I benefited from it. So yeah, and on both occasions, the person has won. On one occasion, only by seven or eight points. So I think there is scope for trying to get back at them. They, 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 the main point square mechanism is driven by them, and you've got to step Ooh. up, and there's nothing else quite as powerful as that combination. It's, it's Yeah, but there, was other, there, was, there is other factors to consider, though, Ronan, in, in Amerigo. In that, yeah, you might have the green and the red, but if you're denied space and denied islands to exploit that strategy, then it can yeah, be... Yeah, it's not... But the best way to deny people space is to build. You know, it's not it's not possible with your ship or, to deny people space. Or cut them so off. So once you can build quicker, 
Mm. Or, or cut, yeah. but, but they're building quicker than you, so cutting them off is very difficult. Yeah, well, then it's a case of getting your ship into a position where you can block the island off, if that's possible. I mean, it's not always possible. So your personal tiles are always really cheap. So they're quite easy for you to get into your player tableau. So they you, you can yeah, use, and they're the ones that block. You're scoring four or five points to stop someone else with that. But if you Look, block, I know, I'm yeah. a bit of a whinge about it. I don't want to get bogged down on these particular no, things. No, no, I mean, it's, it's a combo that's come up twice in the games we've played that two separate people have been able to get them yeah. and they've won the game when they've got that combo. Yeah. Mm, it's a worry, that's all. Anyway, Amerigo. It's an interactive thinky feld which belies its ugliness to provide two hours of cursing each other like pirates and good slightly vicious definitely brain turning over euro fun a strong game not one of feld's absolute best but definitely not a disappointment either well for me amerigo it's the game that i kick myself for looking at it in that S and twenty thirteen and saying, you know what, that's not for me, just based on its on its ugly looks. Because had I have dived in then I would have had four more years of enjoying this game, which I really, really enjoy. It's probably the game I, I turn to most at the moment. I'm really enjoying it. I think it's a very clever game. It's slightly different to other felds in that it is very interactive and can be a bit mean. I do love the cube tower. I love the theater of it. And I love the, that I'm constantly on my toes, constantly watching what everyone else is doing, constantly looking to see what, what actions I can do each round. I can't plan. And I do enjoy that. So yeah, for me, a really strong Feld at the moment. I think it's one of my favorite Feld games. And that is Amerigo. Okay. From Amerigo to Aeon's End. One to four players. 60 minutes playtime, that might be a little low, from indie board and cards and action phase games designed by Kevin Riley. This is a cooperative deck builder, again the second of two here which is non-shuffle deck builder. Players are mages and they live in an underground city called Gravehold which is under constant attack via breaches by various enemies who all come under the collective name of The Nameless, which seems to be an oxymoron to me but there you go, to name something nameless. Hmm. For each particular game, there is one big baddie who we are all going to be fighting back by building our decks. Each person chooses a particular character and they get a unique starting hand and starting deck in a particular order. When you start a player turn, you're going to be able to cast any spells that you've already prepared in what are called breaches. You can have up to four breaches open, so up to four spells ready to be cast, and you're going to have to spend ether, which is the currency off the game in order to get these breaches focused and opened and available to cast spells in once you've cast all the spells and spells usually do damage and they should have some other beneficial effect then you can prepare more spells ready to cast next turns other things you can do like i say you can spend aether to focus or open a breach then there are three different types of cards available in every game there are gems relics or spells gems give you money relics give you beneficial effects and spells generally do damage when you Get cards into your deck, you put them in discard pile, which you are never going to shuffle. Because once you go to draw from your draw deck, it's empty. You get your discard pile, you turn it over and you draw from there. So you are always in charge of what order your cards are going to come out. Another couple of things you can do with your ether. You can gain a charge and every character has a unique power. When they have enough charges in there, they're able to spend them all and trigger their power and they have various different effects and there's various characters available both in the base game and in the expansions which are available at the moment now in terms of taking player turns and indeed the nemesis having turns is a kind of unique system here in which there's a turn order deck and no matter what the player count is there'll always be four player cards in the deck and two nemesis cards and you shuffle them all up and you're going to go through those six turns in whatever order they come out before shuffling those six cards up again and going again however the cards fall which adds a bit of variety to the game now when the nemesis does go any of their cards which are in play will trigger whatever they may be and then you draw another card the types of cards they can have will be either powers which count down over their turns and then unleash something bad they usually have a way for the players to get rid of them before they unleash but not always there are minions who will 
they have some certain amount of health and that we're doing something negative to players every turn and instead of attacking the nemesis and the big baddie when the players do damage they'll be able to attack the minions instead and take them out of the game and then there are attacks directly either from minions or from the nemesis itself and those attacks may be aimed at players they start with 10 health if all the players are ever dead you've lost the game or they may be aimed at the city of Gravehold itself it starts on 30 health if ever it gets to zero you have lost the game each of the Nemesis has its own speciality, which are mixed into basic cards, and the size of the Nemesis deck will vary according to player count. The Nemesis which are available in the base game are the Rageborn, which is a big demon that strikes directly at you, or the Carapace Queen. Now, she controls minions, which are husks, special minions, which come out, and the more husks in play, the much more danger you're in, and it can be an instant loss if too many husks come into play, and the Carapace Queen activates. There's the Prince of Gluttons, who will eat cards from the supply piles for you. Each of the supply piles only has five cards of each in. It's quite a tech, tight little deck builder. And especially with four players, the Prince of Gluttons is especially difficult to defeat there's the crooked mask who will put corruption cards into your deck and when they come in your hand they will activate and they will have a positive but also a very negative effect if corruption cards ever run out you've lost the game and the first expansion included the horde crone who are special trog minions who build up and will do direct attacks to gravehold and such like if you kill the nemesis or there's no cards left in the Nemesis deck and it's got no minions or powers in play. You've driven it off. That also counts as a win, but I can tell you from personal experience, it is much less satisfying than killing it. Sure. I said to myself, when we started talking about Aeon's End, we weren't going to base it around Sentinels of the Multiverse. Because there are similarities in that this is many characters fighting co-op against one unique enemy. But it's hard to avoid altogether. But there are differences as well. This is deck builder. In Sentinels, you get your set deck. Characters are much more unique in Sentinels of the Multiverse. In here, you have one weak spell and one power, but you're all choosing from the same decks to build. Anyway, any thoughts on Aeon's End? I just imagined you were going to mention Sentinels of the Multiverse quite early. <laughs> yeah, it's a good version of Sentinels. Um... What? what? What happened there? What happened? Right. First things first, one. The way you learn this game sat with me perfectly. It came down, it sat down, it held my hand, it whispered sweet nothings into my ear, and all of a sudden I was playing the game like it was an old friend. Yeah, it has that set deck. It says, open this, do this with this, do this with this, do that with that. Don't touch any other cards. You just need to know these few cards it's got its own little special rule sheet and it says just read this and you'll start playing it's one of those situations which you always get these and that you either love it or you hate it when games do that and say no no don't read the rules we'll just teach you what you <laughs> need to know i've been learning star trek frontiers in that there are so many rules you need the walkthrough in aeon's end i actually think you could just read the rule book and played it was nice to have the difference and it was nice to be just walk through it because we're getting into that S and time. I'm reading lots of rule books and some of them, the information is there. It's just trying to dig it out. And it's nice to have something that just, that guides you in gently, even if it is a a simpler game. Uh, I could take it or leave it. What it does do is the whole game flows nicely anyway. It doesn't feel like other games, and yet it feels familiar. So it's both unique and non-challenging. As as you've got lots of twerks and niches and corners you've got to get round, but builds its own feeling within, I don't know, a couch of gaming comfort. Obviously, it's got that deck-building aspect that we're very familiar with, and there are similarities to Sentinels and Multiverse, which we're familiar with. I think the thing that makes this one is the monsters and the, the villains. They all play slightly differently, some some vastly differently, and it all change it up just enough to keep the game interesting and flowing and to, to make everybody work together. In terms of the Nemesis, here's something that I think it does do better than Sentinels of the Multiverse, and I really like, is that there's a structured Nemesis deck. So they're both the cards that are unique to each enemy, plus the basic ones that you mix together, are leveled into one, two, and three. And obviously, you shuffle the threes, put them bottom, then twos, and top, and ones after that. And 
if there is a pacing, there's an escalation, things make sense, and when you're playing through it, okay, it gives you less variety in Sentence of the Multiverse, but you know yourselves if you ever played it, you can draw out three villain cards in Sentence of the Multiverse and go, wow, we have just been battered, we had no chance there. That's not going to happen in Aeon's End. There is a more flat difficulty curve. Now, I'm not saying within game, it is definitely an arc in difficulty, but in terms of game to game to game to game, the difficulty is going to be kind of, well, when I play against the Rageborn, the deck is going to come out in a more similar way than it would in Sense of the Multiverse. I think the second point you made about that it is an actual co-op in that you actually work together, you're actually making decisions together, is 100% true. While you're running your own deck, lots of the challenges say one player loses a spell, or a player discards cards, or a player takes damage, and you decide between you which one it is. And I like that as well. It, it is one in which if you let one person lag behind, you're going to lose the game. It's really weird because on the face of it, you, you've got this big deck of cards in Sentinels, but in this one, you've you've not got a massive amount of choice. Is it nine cards you, you've, you have in yeah, front of you? Yeah, nine cards available each game. So Three different yeah, types. Like, hmm. And there's not a massive choice there. Like, not huge, but a big enough choice. But you've, there's other things you're thinking about. You're thinking about building up your charge counter. I think that was a welcome option because you can cut, build up that and do, do like a big super move. You're opening up your breaches. You're deciding what goes into those breaches. You're preparing for later rounds as well as bringing cards into your deck and doing what you can on this turn. I think that's the thing that made me like it a little bit more than Sentinels, because Sentinels, you know what you've got in your hand. We disagree on this one. We've talked about it. I felt like you kind of, especially in the early missions, which are the only ones I played in Sentinels, you kind of know what you've got to do, and everybody else has got to do this or that. So in Aeon Zend, I felt that there was more of a choice. No. I'm going to put it <laughs> <laughs> We've had this argument many, many times. <laughs> but what that, for me, was actually one of the negatives, in that the characters all feel the same. Yes, you've got that one-off power. Now, the one-off powers are so varied. It's crazy. So if you play with Nim, he's got the ability to discard one and possibly two cards on the top of the Nemesis deck. If you use that during the third phase, where you're getting really hit hard with every card... It's incredible. It makes a huge difference. There's another character, I can't remember the name, but she heals Gravehold for seven damage, which when there's 30 overall, then you quite often get down to single digits. And for her charge, she heals seven. If you get that out twice, that's 14. That's almost 50% more health. Incredible as compared to someone else who casts a spell for plus one damage. These are not comparable powers. I mean, if you're taking on a challenging nemesis, there's definitely ability to go, oh no, these three are the best characters, hands down. So that that's a little bit of an imbalance. But, but, okay, whatever. But because within a game, you've just got one spell unique and you're all choosing from a, a fairly limited set of cards per game, it's not the variety there. You're all doing something very similar. And that's something that's down on me from Sentinels. One thing we haven't really talked about, and I think it is a brilliant and agonising mechanism within the game it's that turn order who gets mm. to go first <laughs> like you, you're there you you might have something ready to go but if if the creature activates first it might ruin it all it is such an agonizing flip to see who's gonna go first i love or it. the creature like goes twice yeah and then it's time to shuffle the deck and you're no! like if they go again we haven't had a chance to react <laughs> ah! i love that turn order mechanism. I absolutely love it. The only slight tiny problem with it is, especially for player, is that you can take a turn, then it might be all the other three players have two turns, and the Nemesis has four turns before your next turn comes along. Yeah. That can be tough. Now, in three player, it's not so bad because what you do with the three player turn deck is you put in player one, player two, player three, and you put in a wild card. So when the wild comes up, the players actually choose who goes. Again, a great co-op situation. And at times when I've played three player, when it's not vital who goes next, there's not someone like, oh, I've got eight damage lined up. We need to deal with that before the nemesis turns. So you can go, anyone can have a go. Whoever hasn't had an extra go or hasn't played in a little while, you just go, oh, go on, you have a go. I mean, you know, 
you'd be sensible about it. Four play you don't have that flexibility and it can. Someone can wait around for a little while. So I adore the turn order deck. Just that really slight caveat that sometimes you might have to be patient. And, and linked into that with the turn order deck is it's one of the mechanisms in which they've scaled the game, Sean, and it scales better than Sentinels of the Multiverse. You have a thinner deck for two players. You've got the turn order, you, know, you, you get two turns for each Nemesis turn and you're working off each other. It's certain nemesis scale better than others like i said prince of gluttons for four players is really difficult because the supply decks tend to run out with four players anyway and if he's eating them all when he eats the last supply deck you've lost the game that can get really really tough but in general the scalability is much better than sensors of the multiverse yeah i can certainly see that now one thing that i usually start with Fernan, is actually the artwork now I kind of, i'm kind of in two minds about the art on this one I think the monsters, the box cover, most of the items you can buy, they're, they're all nice. I wouldn't to say outstanding, but your characters, they were a bit like, ah, oh, they don't seem to fit with the rest of the game somehow. Mm, I'm not feeling you there. No? Sorry. No, I, like, I don't think the characters, I like the artwork. In fact, my biggest problem with the components would be component quality. Mm, because enough. here and there, it's not that great. My box, for example, one of the sides is not the same height as the other three sides. And it started bubbling. It doesn't feel that well made. It's only, I mean, I don't get that fussed by it. But it's probably something I feel like I should mention. Joe, the tokens you get for power and charge, I've replaced them with the little cubes from Pandemic Legacy, the yellow and blue cubes. It just looks cooler. It's just a little thing that makes it, oh, it looks a little bit nicer. It's a bit more obvious to people rather than having these little dull tokens everywhere. And actually, the the one thing that's kind of a bit funny, <laughs> but it really irritates me, you keep track of Gravehold and the Nemesis's life on, on a tracker, like the fantasy flight ones you get with X-Wing and Lord of the Rings, all that, you know, tens one side against the other. The artwork for the Nemesis health tracker is always, it's a picture of the Rageborn. So no matter what Nemesis you're playing, it's, it's health, you look at it, is the Rageborn art, and that just really irritates me. And you're a special <laughs> unique like, snowflake, aren't you? Oh, I'm really irritating. <laughs> if I'm fighting the, the Carapace Queen, I don't want to have Rageborn there and me constantly flicking. I'm like, no, but that's not who I'm fighting. It's really annoying. It didn't even strike me, but to be fair, I think <laughs> it, it, it is a lazy choice, isn't it? It's, it's a lazy choice. It's, it's, Use another piece of art. <laughs> There's more appropriate things. <laughs> I admit that's a bit mental. How did you find the iconography <laughs> and being able to read the cards and work out where everything's happening quite quickly? All grand. I mean, it's a lot of writing. The Nemesis cards especially, they're not very exciting, but... There's, there's information on there and that it has its own rather than symbols and iconography it, has, it actually uses words so the game's got its own language kind of thing. like you need to unleash will be used and that will mean something different for each nemesis but it's all there it's all written out on the card and actually in terms of lots of reading each character has a backstory each nemesis has a backstory and for some reason and you know i usually moan about fantasy settings and stuff this setting I genuinely feel like I am a mage. It is quite desperate. We are being attacked by these things that are coming through, you know, through breaches, especially when Rageborn does it. Because like when it description, it's like a big claw comes through a hole and hits us and disappears again. It's like he's ripping against the curtain of reality. I, I really get in the theme for some reason, Sean. Yeah, it kind of felt to me like that, a game that we keep trying to play, Shadow Rift. But I'm much more accessible. Did it feel like that with a better rule book? <laughs> I was about to say much more accessible. Yeah. <laughs> with a rule book would help, not just a collection of rules. Wow, well, Shadow Rift was a missed opportunity. That had, that had, yeah, promise, but it never delivered. Anyway, Aeon's End, Sean. We've referenced about 18 other games when we're talking <laughs> about it. What do you actually think of Aeon's End itself? Well, I was on board with this one from the very start. I kickstarted it. I followed the design process. I saw the care and attention they put into it. And I was very pleased with the product I got. It's a highly thematic deck builder. I'm always going to enjoy deck builders. We talked about it. It's genuine co-op. I feel like the villains make the game. The differences in the way they do things. Yes, maybe not your own characters might not be the most varied. But the villains themselves, they are varied. They do all do different things. They make you think. And I 
love the game for it. Love the turn order. Love the way you get into the game, the learning aid. Yeah, it's, for me, Aeon's End is, is a big hit. It's a very good, difficult co-op. It feels unique, despite having those Sentinels references and a fantasy theme. It hasn't got the endless replayability that I kind of find in Sentinels because... Yes, there are several different types of gems and relics and spells, but they're not that varied. And within a game, each character is very similar to each other. So I don't have that whole choice of different tactics and putting this character with that character with that character to see how they combo against this enemy. That's not available. Your tactics are defined by the nine cards in each game, and you're all going to be following a very similar path. Having said that, I'm comparing it to, as you're going to find out in an episode of Two's Time, when we do our final do our top 10, one of the best games in the world. It's not quite as good as one of the best games in the world. But if we redid our top 50 now, I think Aeon's End would be in there for me. I just want them to keep coming with expansions because every different nemesis brings a bit of life into it. And I've already been playing with the... Horde Chrome, which is the first expansion I'll get hold of. Keep those coming, guys. I'll be playing on Aeon's End for a long time going forward. Love it. Sean? Our final game of the episode is Holmes, Sherlock and Mycroft. 2015 release from Devere and Cosmos, designed by Diego Ibanez. It's a two-player game. It's a set collection game, loosely themed on an investigation where Mycroft and his more famous brother Sherlock have been hired to solve the same investigation. It's the last seven days of the investigation, and generally what you have is a player board that has characters that allow an action when a worker, and you get three of these, is placed on them. The characters and stroke actions allow players to collect investigation markers and to use those to gather cards depicting an aspect of the investigation. The cards have a set value and a set number of each type. Each clue type will score for the person with the majority minus the amount that the other's player has. If I have seven of the nine value card and Ronan just had one, then I'm going to score eight points. Nine for having the majority in the nine cards Minus the one that wrote it. Map fragment cards score slightly different. The heart of the game lies in the characters and how they manipulate what you do. A new character is added each day until the seven are up. And then count up your cards. And that's Holmes, Sherlock and Mycroft. Ronan. I have written one word with a question mark after it. Just for you, Sean. Just to get you going on Holmes, Sherlock and Mycroft. One. theme question mark um the artwork brought me into the theme ronan but the mechanisms of the game quickly just threw that theme out the window and said nah yeah so it totally hangs on its mechanisms that's what we're saying it's not really telling a story i'm not too sure why we're collecting cards as the as the homes boys but we'll run with that it's okay and in fact the timing of those three action selections is surprisingly tricky on occasion and more than once i've fallen foul where i've gone oh i've left myself still on the card that i need to use with my last meeple or oh, i'm behind in something and your meeple's already on one of the non-major characters and on the base characters if i go there this character's going to disappear next turn i really need it not to and this slightly thinking when you first start off you just go oh this is all right i'll do this i'll do that very few choices only four characters as it goes on there is a mild development of the thought pattern required yeah it all starts off very tight where you've just got one or two areas where you can get those clue tokens which then are turned into chances to pick up cards and try to get that set collection going and it's very tight and you kind of have to either go big or try and spread out your movements but then as things come you don't always get the same cards i think there's one or two that are always held back it's just adapting to what comes out and seeing how you can manipulate that planning that one to turn ahead always because that's that's a major thing you you block yourself in this game you don't nobody else blocks you See, there's no one to point the finger at. Yeah, <laughs> <much>. <laughs> ah, what did I do? 
before. Talking about trying to get those, those clue tokens and how... Pro- Why are they... Poor Wiggins. What has he done to upset the designers of this game? The poor fella comes out every game with five tokens available on him. Dink, dink. He's knackered. He's out of the game again. And there's never been a game of this that Wiggins didn't last in more than one turn. It didn't happen. <sighs> yeah, he's got other things to do. He's, he's in and out. Yeah. Here you go, boys. It's five tokens. I'm off down the pub. <laughs> but that mechanism that they've done with it, and, and it always happens with him, it leaves me slightly worried. It's slightly inelegant that it's clear that some characters are better than others. And some are just vital. You just have to use them. And on occasion... With the draw of characters, the game can stimmy a bit early on where you go, we're all doing much for much this year. Yeah, the choice of cards in itself is quite interesting, but it's still sort of... Mm. And then sometimes characters can come out towards the end and they're just they're no use anymore. And I don't know that the characters are all that interesting. For me, it's good that the characters are available to everyone. So yeah, if there were some that were overpowered and they were only available for one person then that would be a major problem in the game. As it is, I think, generally, unless you're really unlucky, there's a nice arc to this game. It starts off small with small increments, and then all of a sudden you can expand. There can be games where that doesn't happen, but it's such a short game, it doesn't bother me as much as it it possibly could. Yeah, I I agree it's it's a short game. It's just that sometimes when I'm going to get it out, I can remember those games where it was a little bit flat and I go, hmm. But then sometimes it comes out and it's, you know, yeah. It doesn't always sell itself to me with the lack of theme and the characters being a bit up and down. But what, well, something I do love about it, now, a lot of majority games like this, let's say we were fighting for the sevens. Once I got to four, sevens then become useless to you and you just stop fighting for them. And what you're fighting for limits over time. And, one of the really good designs they've done for is that they don't do that. They make every card important. And even if I have one, if you like, and and got the most sevens, you're still going to want them because they're preventing me from scoring points. That was clever in itself to keep the game alive on the other side as opposed to the action selection side. It's not the worst from my mouth. It's a very clever mechanism. There's always a useful card because you're always in the game. I like it a lot. Overall, this is a nice, gentle game. I don't get excited about playing Home Sherlock and Mycroft. I get mildly tickled. It's a game you can't take your eye off because you're always, mm, what's that person doing? What are they up to? What are they doing over there? But it's it's for non-confrontational two-player gaming, I'd say. When you're in the mood to chill out, have a glass of port, discuss the day, and yet still solve a crime across London. See, what I've written down, definite holiday or pub game. And that's exactly <laughs> where it's for. It doesn't take up a lot of space. It doesn't take up a lot of mental space. It's a nice little puzzle that will not tax you too much, but also not leave you too bored. Nice little traveling game. It'd be silly to turn down a game of it because it is clever in what it does and it does keep your interest. So, yeah, it's a nice game. I'm not going to rave about it, but I'm not going to scorn it too either. And that's Holmes, Sherlock, and Mycroft. And that is the end of this part. We will see you out in our outro in just a few moments. Folks, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Game Pit Podcast. We hope you enjoyed us chewing the fat over those six games. An overall, very positive episode, I'd say, Sean. I think only one game got a bit of a kick in. Well, yeah, for, well, for me, two games got a kick in and one was a bit meh. Yeah, but you said Magic Maze is a good game. You just hated it. I think everyone can read their own conclusions from there. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. <laughs> So anyway, thank you very much, Roland. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Coming up for you, our top 10 games of all time. And our first s and previews will be coming up very shortly. Keep on this channel for s and coverage pre, during, and after the show. We are super excited. We've even started getting some s and games in already because we're lucky little so-and-sos. Yes! 
You're very excited, aren't you? Bless you. I'm very, more than very excited. I missed last year. This is two <laughs> years' worth of excitement coming out. Oh, dear. Is it, are the Essen Halls ready? Probably not. I'm just going to rampage through them naked. Ah! Pick up ah! <laughs> anyway, enough about me <laughs> treating the Essen public. Okay, as always, we are very proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there. And to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. If you wish to email us, we are the Game Pit Podcast at gmail.com. And another fantastic way to contact us is to come and see us on our Board Game Geek Guild. We're on social media, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter at Game Pit Podcast. If you wish to download our episodes, we're on Podbean, iTunes, and Stitcher. And please feel free to give us a review or a little likey in there. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Music by E. Aaron. S an excited boy, boy, boy S an excited boy, boy, boy. boy.